I'm Brandon Roberts. Welcome to the Pike County Report. With me, as always, is Judge Executive Wayne T. Rutherford. Also with us today is Pike County Energy and Community Development Director Charles Carlton. And uh, gentlemen, today we're going to talk about the compressed natural gas revolution that we think we anticipate going on nationwide, maybe even worldwide in the near future. Uh, Brandon, we're, we're really going to talk about uh, Pike County, Kentucky, America's energy capital. Uh, we trademarked that uh, a few years ago, and uh, that trade that logo, the trademark uh, or logo, trademark logo has uh, circulated throughout this country. Uh, that has got us in contact with a, a lot of people in the energy field uh, throughout uh, America. Uh, Pike County, Kentucky, we produce 53% of the natural gas that's produced in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, uh, which means by far that we produce more natural gas than any other county. We are one of the leading natural gas producers in central Appalachia. The Devonian Shell is rich in natural gas, and we're blessed. Uh, I know that uh, a county judge down Johnson County, our friend said to me recently, he said, uh, he looked up and he said, Lord, why did you put all the mineral, uh, natural gas, and coal in one county, Pike? And uh, so, and he further said, well, the Lord has blessed you all to have that much energy that he's placed there. Not only did the Lord place it there, he, he, he gave the wisdom to be able to mine the coal that uh, that had powered America, that kept the lights on in America, and uh, we uh, and I know when when I was growing up, Charles, that mm -hmm. they give credit to coal for winning World War One and World War Two, because they was able to produce the fighting weapons, uh, our tanks and artillery and all of that, that we was able to fight the war and keep America free. And at that time, coal miners was looked on as hero of which they really are even today. But the national media and the EPA in Washington, and they have portrayed these people as villains and that coal is bad. Uh, we are fighting that battle today with EPA. But today we're here to talk about a natural gas component which we are energy blessed to be energy rich with. Uh, we're going to talk about compressed natural gas. We're going to talk about uh, that we have an opportunity through economic development uh, to uh, have the first public, and I want to restate that, first public uh, natural, uh, a biofuel or dual fuel station in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. We know that the governor of the Commonwealth has signed uh, uh, with 14 other states in a consortium uh, to change over fleet-wise uh, the vehicles of state government in Kentucky and 15 other states. I remember, Charles, there were states not only in the south, but you had Maine in the northeast, and they mentioned Oklahoma mm -hmm. in the west, and New Mexico in the west. But the, the states primarily are in the south. So we're going to be talking about uh, biofuel, uh, and uh, dual fuel, same thing, but it's a, and Charles Carlton reminded me uh, about two months ago one day, he said, Judge, you and I, and probably every, most people we see out here today, we've lived through two revolutions of transportation, energy fuel, and, uh, and he was so right when he reminded me that the that the coal-fired steam engine uh, in 19 and 50s, and I, I said, Charles, and after the 57 flood, there was eight steam engines in the Shelby Yard. We saw them hauled out together in a row, pulled by the diesel engines taken to Russell, and we never saw them back up to Big Sandy again. And I understood what Charles was saying. We had a fuel revolution. When I was growing up, and uh, uh, we had five tipples in the vicinity of Shelby where I was raised. 
and all of the trucks hauling coal, I remember the old Diamond Rio, the International, mm -hmm. all of those trucks, there's gasoline. Charles again reminded me that that we that we went from those gasoline trucks up until the 60s, right on up, till till somebody perfected a diesel engine, and he also reminded me that uh, <laughs> that you, if it was steel or something you, or car, you'd refer to junk when they process gasoline, diesel. What was left over? It was the impurities, and they. they they found a way to use it in an engine and get uh, better gas mileage, I presume, at that time. And a bigger truck. We didn't have the, the, the large trucks in. We all, all, all we had was the small, small truck, smaller truck. We saw the advent of the larger trucks to haul fuel. So uh, we now are leading the way. Pike County is leading the way, and there's no doubt about that. We, uh, about three and a half years ago, Charles Carlson, you put together the first natural gas forum or summit here in Pikeville. Uh, you was able to bring people in from several states as far west as California. Uh, I can remember the fellow we had from West Virginia that brought a truck over. He was even testing. And, but, but that was a very successful summit when you hadn't even heard of using using natural gas as a transportation fuel. So we have been on the forefront in Pike County for a number of years of trying to, to think outside the box and to side and to, to be part of this new revolution because the fact that that we produce fifty three percent of the natural gas in the Commonwealth and we ought to be a leader and we are paving the way. Charles, uh, building on what Judd said, could you take us maybe, first of all, explain a little bit what, for people who don't know what biofuel is, and then maybe take them through the process of, from, of, of natural gas from the wellhead to a, to a fuel tank of a vehicle? Sure, Brandon. Um, biofuel is fairly simple. Um, whether it be diesel or gas, um, Many of the engines uh, that use natural gas uh, will start on a different fuel, either gasoline or diesel fuel, and then once the engine's warmed up, it converts over and starts running on a, largely on natural gas. There are exceptions. Uh, the Honda Civic, for example, the natural gas version operates just on natural gas. The so that's why it's referred to as bifuel or dual fuel because there are two fuel systems on the same vehicle. The production of natural gas uh, as a fuel in many ways is parallel with the production of petroleum to gasoline. You do not run a vehicle on crude petroleum that comes out of the ground. It goes to a refinery. Uh, with n natural gas, ga as Many people here are very familiar with this. The natural gas that you, uh, as it comes out of the ground, has uh, primarily methane, but it which is uh, one atom of carbon, four atoms of hydrogen. But what you have is that there are a number of other uh, hydrocarbons that are present, which is typically ethane, butane, hexane, and so on. Uh, typical, I mean, these are referred to as natural gas liquids. And so the natural gas uh, from the wellhead is run through a plant such as at Bowman with Mark West, where the natural gas liquids are stripped out, and that's a stripping plant. And then you produce pipeline quality gas, which has a um, which is primarily methane. And that is what's used either for production of, of liquefied natural gas or compressed natural gas. What we're discussing here is compressed natural gas, and once the gas has been purified to, to essentially methane, then that's suitable for an automotive fuel, and it's used as such in a number of countries around the world. And this is uh, 
uh, something that uh, countries that are typically rich in uh, natural gas uh, you use have a significant amount of their vehicles offered with natural gas and it's not really an option it's really the typical choice uh, and it saves these countries on the cost of petroleum. Charles let's talk about the pipelines you mentioned uh, we have three in the county tell us about the three pipelines. Well we have various uh, major pipelines that um, come into Pike County or traverse Pike County but uh, the major plant that we have that that is stripping natural gas is at Ma is at Bowman, and so exiting Bowman is a, a major line headed to the to Pie, West Virginia area, which is the base of Horse Bend Mountain on US 52, and then it goes on to the northeastern United States. Uh, that line is uh, passing. Uh, through to 119 and then crosses the Tug River and then goes on to Pi. What we're talking here, we want to make it clear, is economic development. That uh, Pike County government is never going to be in the service station business. Uh, have no intention of being in the service station business. Uh, that will be handled by the private sector. We, we have some confidentiality agreements, Brandon, that we can't discuss today. But uh, that will be announced to the public in the future by the, the people who will be doing it. Uh, I might add that we certainly have uh, have worked with Denny Rohr and Charles. You all, we have a good relationship with him. He assisted with the forum we had three Correct. years ago, and uh, Denny Rohr has been a pusher in regard to this concept that we have. And you also have another group locally, is it primarily the Hamiltons and the green name, I don't know the name, but, but they, they also would want to get into Central Appalachia to provide stations in Central Appalachia. Our role is only economic development. Uh, we, are, we are looking to provide a site at, uh, at Scott Fork. Now why are we at Scott Fork, Charles? You, you can tell them why we we're over to Scott Fork. It's the only location in Pike County where this pipeline goes that you have availability of clean gas. And what you've made reference before, uh, you've made reference before that it's like having a service station out from Catlisburg where the petroleum refinery is and a service station out there. And also elaborate on the cost that it will be for people getting in the business away from these lines that, that well, say that if you owned property and you had a gas well right on the hill behind it, and which has not uh, has not been stripped, then of course explain to the to to the public of what exactly uh, what is going on that they have to do and they have to come up with funding to do. Well, the reason that Scott Fork is a, a good location, or excellent location, is that the main Columbia gas transmission line is on the ridge. Uh, line above Scott Fork, and it passes and crosses very near the entrance of a way into the Scott Fork Industrial Park. Uh, it crosses 119, so it's possible that is a very uh, possible to put a pipeline from the interstate pipeline down and to a compressor, and then to have uh, compressed natural gas available for dispensing as a fuel. Uh, well, let me, let's talk about the uh, BTU and uh, uh, in regard to compressed natural gas and the uh, cost uh, of, of compressed natural gas, what it will be. And I, I think that people will be certainly surprised at the savings not that that county government will have, that state government will have, because mm -hmm. the governor has signed with those 14 other states. And in, in 2013, we have been told that they will be purchasing some vehicles uh, directly from the factory. And one of those is for, from the Ford plant in Louisville, uh, which the governor of the Commonwealth was over there several months ago for the ribbon cutting. And they are producing a Ford vehicle uh, now uh, at uh, Louisville, 
and in the, in 20 and I think they're online now I understand that they're right. online because I think Brandon you pulled something off of their site didn't you did. and you can buy the kit to retrofit the other ones relatively cheap actually yes yeah so uh, Charles tell us about the BTU and the, the, the 50 percent savings of what's related to diesel fuel or to gasoline the way uh, compressed natural gas is sold is sold on the same basis as gasoline. Well, it's about 114,000 BTU in a gallon of gasoline, or another way of saying it, for a million BTU would purchase you the equivalent of nine gallons of gasoline. Natural gas is typically marketed per million BTU, and and that was how compressed natural gas is, but it's broken down into increments of about 114,000 BTU. So what you have is the gasoline equivalent gallon. You're receiving so many cubic feet, but it is ba the pricing is based upon the BTU content. And the, for example, on a this morning on the price of natural gas, which is traded uh, on uh, the NYMEX exchange, natural gas is at two dollars and eighty cents per million BTU. Well, divide that by nine, and you're getting thirty some cents a gallon. That does not include a profit. That doesn't include the stripping and the transmission and so forth and so on. What you really end up with is that that a pricing of natural gas tends to, to uh, shadow the price of uh, gasoline, but basically at about 50% the cost. It takes the same amount of BTU to do any amount of work. In other words, if you're getting 30 miles to the gallon and you're, you're doing that amount of work of driving 30 miles and you use one gallon of gasoline, it of 114,000 BTU, it will take you 114,000 BTU of natural gas to do the same amount of work to go those 30 miles. But another way of looking at it is that if the price of the natural gas is half, you're getting the equivalent of 60 miles to the gallon if you were buying it, if you were paying for gasoline. It's the because the price is half. And Charles Judd said something earlier I found interesting. Uh, um, he said you and him had discussed that some uh, service stations that offer CNG, of course, to the public, will have the BTU equivalent shown. Yes, they do. And I guess I'm assuming that's to avoid confusion for people who think they're getting less fuel for the. They're getting the same. They're getting on a BTU basis exactly what they would get with a gallon of gasoline. Well, along those lines, let's um, let's talk about um, the automotive industry. Judge, you and I have talked about it at length. Charles, you and I have too. Um, offering these vehicles, um, and of course, but the Brandon, large truck manufacturers. The thing that people need to understand, this revolution is here. This is a reality. It's a reality check. The industry, and Charles will give you the details in it, but your large trucks, like the coal trucks, like the trucks that they, they haul over to Kellogg's, or the box trucks that pull the, the boxes, uh, they are, are being uh, manufactured, some presently, some in 2013. Uh, we mentioned Ford Motor Company already has a line in Louisville. They take the trucks over and, and bring them back, and then they, they go out to be sold. Ch Charles will give you the details on those trucks, but uh, getting back to you talking about the service station, and I think that we need to get people to, to really understand that this is a the dual fuel is, will be sold at a service station not by Pike County, but if, if uh, through economic development that some could be attracted to that site and the station would be built and it would have uh, four different fuels. It would naturally have the tank that sells gasoline, then it would have a, a pump that sells gasoline, then you go up to another pump that gets uh, 
compressed natural gas, and then you'd have your diesel pump. And then you, you, they would sell propane in the cylinders, small cylinders, so you'd really have sold it that. And I visioned that there would be a, a, a store, right, like a regular service station, and they would sell what they normally sell in a convenience store. So it is, uh, so Charles, I'd like for you to take you from there, but I just wanted people to understand that this is economic development, it's jobs, and what it means to the taxpayer that we will be changing our fleet over, say solid waste trucks, we will be the ones we rent per year for our solid waste department and the six tr trucks that we lease every year, the large trucks. We will be buying, in the future, when this public station becomes available, dual fuel, we will be leasing and purchasing vehicles in the future and we will be filing for grants to change others over that we have in our fleet presently. Pike County has a big fleet. Uh, we have uh, 1,200 miles of road. We have an excellent road department, great employees, uh, good equipment, and we will be changing those over. But look what that means to us. Charles, I noticed last month when the finance director and I, and we look at every bill that goes through county government, and we looked at the, at the previous $40,000 per month just for diesel fuel in the solid waste department. One month. That don't, the road department, of course, look at what they use, that diesel fuel and all of, of that heavy equipment and light equipment and the trucks we have. And so we're looking at savings for the taxpayers. Uh, the city of Pacwa, I have talked to the city manager and they say, yes, if there's a public station available and there's dual fuel, we certainly would look. And with Board of Education, talk to the school superintendent, talk to Nancy Casey, transportation. Very interested, Sandy Valley Transportation. Talk to the director of Sandy Valley Transportation. And they are certainly interested because it brings down their fuel cost, the bottom line, 50%. And I don't think that we, we stated, and of course you, you've seen it on the screen, how the cost is one half of whatever the market is selling at the time for the price of natural gas. Am I correct, Charles? Yes, it's, it's tied to the price of natural gas. It's tied to the, the price of natural gas. So it is, uh, so Charles, I'll let you again to take over from here, and I hope I, I didn't confuse you, but I just want to make sure that people understand what this means for the future of every citizen, not only here, but in this country. And I also want you to talk about the security of America. And I know that uh, I've been to the Pentagon in Washington twice, and uh, they have talked about that this is a serious uh, security issue in America that we have to have. And, and Charles, you, you remind everybody, and I know I hear you talking about it all the time, this is domestic fuel, which is, uh, which is here in America. And look what this is going to do to our economy in this country and help, help us get out of this rut we're in in this economic. Go right ahead. Well, Judge, I think you're absolutely correct. Um, this is the single largest source of domestic fuel that's untapped for transportation fuel. And we're having ever-expanding uh, discoveries of natural gas. We've gone from a situation to where we have a 100-year supply or better and uh, at a very affordable price. And so to use it for a transportation fuel, every gallon that equivalent that we use is one gallon of foreign oil that does not have to be imported into the United States and we do not have to be exporting money to subsidize people who do not like us. And, the, and this is building our own American economy. Uh, the, uh, we may well be into a situation where there will be increasing prices of oil, but with the volume of natural gas that we have uh, is a relatively stable fuel. Uh, so that is one of the national security aspects to the use of it and for the for retaining those dollars within the economy of the United States and within Kentucky. 
The other thing that I want to, to mention is that you've discussed several major fleet users. What we really lack is, is the infrastructure to deliver natural gas at, for a transportation fuel, and that's where putting in a service station is very important. We don't lack the supply of fuel itself, and that is the critical thing that we need to stress. We have almost a, uh, uh, all that we would need if we were running every vehicle in the United States on it. But the uh, savings will start to um, accrue, and the other thing is that initially you end up with situations where you have fleets of vehicles that can return to a station that tip do not need a fully developed network. And examples are school bus systems, solid waste trucks, um, and increasingly over the road trucks. And we are starting to get a situation as we're developing across the United States through major interstates uh, where you, where stations have natural gas and it's posted and it's available and uh, it's sold like any other fuel. Charles, uh, someone mentioned the other day that um, you know they don't know, they've never seen a car that runs on CNG. Well, wouldn't that be maybe different if there was a place where people could get the they CNG? They are. We uh, did it. Dennis Roy has a car that runs on natural gas. Yes. Yeah, he has trouble getting the fuel out of Chattanooga <laughs> or somewhere, don't he, yes. Charles? Yes, actual. Uh, but yeah. but we know uh, Charles and I. We we know that uh, in tw by 2013, by the end of 2013, and we know that uh, we'll have approximately 80 plus vehicles in in this county that that uh, can that needs to be serviced. Uh, we know that we we have that knowledge, uh, so as as we move forward, we move forward with that. But Charles, uh, we I don't think we've gone into detail about the the manufacturers, especially General Motors and Chrysler and Ford. I don't think we've we've said enough about uh, the the type that they are. Okay. Going to just go ahead and take that, and so the people can understand that these will be available and are are available today in some markets. The three major manufacturers of, of, of trucks in the United States, uh, just to say Chrysler, General Motors, and Ford, are all producing uh, their pickup line with uh, natural gas as an option. The General Motors line is the Silverado pickup, the Ford, of course, is the F-250, the heavier trucks. The Chrysler line is the Dodge Ram truck. Um, Dodge uh, is uh, producing it with the uh, crew cab 4x4. Four four. Uh, their initial um, buyers for these trucks are uh, companies such as Chesapeake, Appalachia, uh, the, uh, uh, those that are uh, maintained within a relatively uh, uh, more restricted area. The, uh, as the number of service stations increase, then they, they will be out on the main road. The other thing that I need to go over with people, that part of the reason these are by fuel is that these trucks have a really long range. And the reason is because you're, you have your standard fuel system and then you have your natural gas fuel system. They will typically start on, uh, for example, on diesel fuel, um, warm the engine up, convert over to running primarily on natural gas, and uh, if you run out of natural gas, uh, in the case of the Dodge, it's all seamless. The uh, fuel computer knows, knows that the amount of gas is going down to zero. Uh, it switches back over and it just runs on diesel fuel. Uh, so you have, you have both fuels uh, and you, you end up with, with longer range on these vehicles than you do on standard vehicles. So it's not as complex as maybe some would think. No, it's not as complex. It's actually uh, uh, pretty simple. 
Brandon Charles asked me the other day what my home was heated with, and we got into talking about the safety of CNG. And I know I, I was telling Charles my grandfather was absolutely scared to death of gasoline. I mean, he had a fear of gasoline. If he smelled gasoline, I mean, if somebody was, had a cigarette or thought they was going to light a match, he was gone. Or he would say, don't light a match. Uh, or if somebody was walking towards him, uh, so Charles uh, Charles asked me, so what what do you hit your home with? And I told him, tell him what you told him. I told I told the judge, I said, you know, about a third of the people here in this county heat their home with natural gas, but I don't know a single person that heats their home with gasoline. Well, and CNG is, is very safe. It dissipates in the air, and it don't hang low. So I get that question all the time about the safety of CNG. And it's and one, clean, isn't it? And it's very clean, and uh, it's clean. You know, President Bush wanted to have uh, hydrogen as the basis for fuel long range in the United States, which is a, um, a very good thought. Uh, but natural gas has one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms, and so in many ways largely achieves that goal. The, in terms of safety, remember, when you're driving around, you've got gasoline in, a, in a, about a 16-gauge tank uh, between your two frame rails, and that's it. But you don't have it in, when you have compressed natural gas, you have it in a cylinder that's been tested to, to uh, about 8,000 PSI, and uh, you're only retaining uh, typically about 3,600 PSI, and the cylinders are uh, virtually indestructible. Uh, I watched the testing, of, and I, I'm going to go into how they're, sure. how they're tested. Sure. Um, I watched the testing uh, at the Virginia Natural Gas Association. But the first test is that a crane lifts a natural gas cylinder up to over 100 feet in the air and drops it straight onto a concrete pad. And it just bounce. And then the test was run with the reverse with the valve end down. And it was dropped from 100 feet. It did break the valve off and the gas exited and the cylinder moved but there was no ignition. And then I watched with a natural gas cylinder uh, locked down and shot with a 357 Magnum and it wouldn't penetrate. And then I watched a Lincoln town car that had two natural gas cylinders placed in the trunk and put into a car crusher. And so you watch as the hydraulic ram took that town car and crushed it over, and then the hydraulic ram came through and reduced that town car down to about a four foot by four foot brick. And then had to use two wreckers and hooks and peel that open, and the natural gas cylinders were in there and were not open. So I don't, the only, I don't know how much more testing you can do, but what you, what you really kind of come to the conclusion as, after, as you're watching this in slow motion is that actually they're considerably safer than your fuel tank that all of us are driving around with. Charles, uh, three or four years ago, we, we wrote Cargill Corporation, and told them that we, we wanted to take a look at off-the-road trucks uh, because of our coal industry and because of the construction that's going on and planned in this county. And uh, Cargill Corporation referred us, and, and I want you to tell the people about the difference in compressed natural gas and liquefied natural gas used. And, and we, uh, we caused a and you can you can give the name of the company because they came here and held a news conference. Sure. Uh, and uh, matter of fact, I talked to Dennis Strower the other day, and uh, he was in Florida on vacation, and he just had lunch the, the, the day before with uh, the head of this company. But uh, we was able to bring this this uh, group uh, to 
America, from South America, from Colombia, to complete their their study in regard to uh, LNG. And uh, uh, I know that you can go in detail about that was done. You you was in from the beginning to the end. Uh, we had a local coal operator who had now in business in another county and. And he uh, he constructed a uh, an area for them to to do their test on and to collect the data. So I'll let you go into that a little bit and of course explain that the the, the difference and it's not that just a step in the process that uh, you've told me before. Well, the difference between compressed natural gas and liquefied natural gas is uh, obviously one is liquid. To liquefy it. Once you reduce natural gas below 276 degrees below zero, it is in a liquid form and consequently occupies much less volume. The, for large uh, trucks, and by that I mean rock trucks, uh, liquefied natural gas uh, is, a, is a better fuel. The, for a thousand horsepower diesel engine, the um, because you can carry more of it. The company that Judge is referring to is Gaseous Fuel Systems of Weston, Florida, and we ended up doing tests on the Cat Triple um, Seven rock truck, looking at the use of natural gas to reduce the cost for the production of coal and surface mining, and very successful test. Currently, gaseous fuel systems is uh, testing on the largest rock trucks in the world in Wyoming with some of the largest ones uh, at, at about 240 ton capacity trucks uh, on use of liquefied natural gas. What you get is that when these trucks have over 2,000 horsepower engines, so you get, if you think the savings are, are pretty good on, a, a, say, an 18-wheeler or a, a solid waste truck, they're very, very important on, on a piece of equipment of that size. So to that end, also, I want to mention that CAT has announced here this month that CAT equipment will be um, uh, coming available with natural gas engines on biofuel in the CAT line, including tests are beginning on the use of natural gas on railroad locomotives. So the CAT is in, uh, has formed a uh, uh, a memorandum of understanding and agreement with Westport uh, Corporation, and uh, so I think that you will be seeing in, in in coming years not just, for example, the Cat D6, which is is available with a natural gas engine, but you will see uh, biofuel Cat vehicles uh, with uh, dedicated natural gas. Well, Charles, we had stated earlier when this first came out that we were going to be the first public, try to have yeah. the first public yes. station in Kentucky. Not the first station, we're aware of the other ones. Um, CNG itself, this, this the technology is not, I mean it's relatively new, but it's not brand new, is it? No, it's not brand new and it's, it's uh, for example, countries like Argentina and Brazil, um, millions of of cars operating using compressed natural gas, India, for example, uh, Pakistan, uh, could continue on. The largest manufacturer in Europe of natural gas vehicles is uh, Chrysler, or Fiat, however right. you want to look at it. Uh, the uh, no, the technology is not is not new at all. It's just that we have not had the availability of the fuel here in the United States. And we're, we're blessed to have that. Pipeline, which has strip fuel right next to, to the industrial park, and we look at that as industrial development, and we look at the big picture of what it would do with the bottom line. He was talking about liquefied natural gas. A study was done with one 
coal company here, one of our largest producers, and it showed 1.7 million savings per year just on the fuel of their Cat 7 off the road trucks. Am I right? That's correct. So, I mean, it's, it's you know, unbelievable, as Charles just said, <coughs> of if you think of what it saves on these smaller vehicles, look what it does for the coal industry. Now, I can remember you had the, tell about the fellow who was here from South, from South America, stayed here in Pikeville and, and went, went with you when they were doing the first testing, and then tell him about the fellow who was here who was the vice president of the, one of the largest gold mines in the, in the world. Well, we had a visitor from El Soral Mine in Colombia. El Soral Mine is the largest mine in South America. And in one pit, they produce more coal than all of Pike County. And you imagine that. If we were a state, we'd be 10th in coal production, which we are today. Of course, yeah. we're fighting this battle with EPA. But they, they produce over 32 million metric tons of coal per year out of that one pit. And on any given day, they have uh, over 200, uh, 240 ton trucks operating in that pit. They don't have the infrastructure at this moment to, to get uh, liquefied natural gas to site. So this is something that they're very excited about the possibility of doing uh, because of the savings. You can imagine operating a fleet of 240 trucks what, what your savings would be. Well, it seems to me, like as the judge said, it's a no-brainer to, to, for back here, we got the transmission line, we got the yes. gas. And you what all... About the, the, the fellow from the gold... From the and we had, we had a visit from uh, the largest, uh, one of the largest mining companies in South America and uh, in the iron ore business, as well as uh, from Barrick Gold, one of the largest producers of um, gold in the world. These, the major mining houses across the world are, are looking at this, uh, and I think as CAT and well, other, they, they uh, use, has it available. They use fuel 100% of the time, pushing and backing and pushing, Correct. don't they? Yes, they do. So uh, you can also, uh, as CAT will be moving that direction, you can use it in your dozer line, your inloader line, uh, so on. And Brandon, imagine what that's going to do to the economic situation that we have in this country today. This could help us bring <coughs> us out of this deep recession that they're talking about it's going to take years to do. Look, this could start and help bring us out of this recession nationwide in America. And one, one thing the United States has done in the past is that fuel revolutions are not something that drag on for a long time and they tend to uh, move through and, and, the, and, and when major manufacturers, when, for example, in the early 1950s when General Motors came with their line of diesel switch engines and their uh, passenger and freight locomotives, uh, diesel fuel was eight to 10 cents a gallon. Correct. And, and it didn't take the railroads too long to discover what that would do for their bottom line. Because as we said, that was what was left over when they made the gasoline. Right. It became cheap. <laughs> well, as I said, I mean, it's like, why would you not use the natural gas if it's here? It's, we got the pipeline, we get... Well, it's and, and the other thing that I will want to mention is that while it, the initial station would be tied to the pipeline, it's also possible to transport uh, either compressed natural gas or liquefied natural gas, and it's done every day. And uh, so other stations do not, you do not have to be necessarily apt, uh, tied to a uh, pipeline. The first one obviously uh, fits there, but the other subsequent ones can take from the pipeline and be transported to a That's location. Correct. Also give us the calls. If, if these two local uh, that we've discussed and keep them updated on, uh, tell them the cost of uh, heating and so forth and to get compressed natural gas. If they go into business and they have a pipeline behind their business and they have to, to buy the equipment, I think it's over a million dollars it would take or somewhere around that to get in the business. 
if they use that pipeline behind us where they build a station, where they have a well available to them? Well, really for, for um, transportation fuel, you can't use wellhead gas. Uh, Correct. You have to, uh, it has too many other gases that, that are present, uh, and you have variable fuel quality. And what you really want is just like uh, gasoline, you want, you want a known constant fuel. And so uh, that's what you get by, by, by taking it from a pipeline. You can uh, transport that from the pipeline and have a tank, just the same as you deliver gasoline to a service station and another one, uh, you have tanks, and the tank truck arrives and delivers gasoline, and then, of course, that's dispensed through, through your pump when you pull in to buy gasoline. Same process works for natural gas. You can deliver compressed natural gas to a tank. Tank feeds the uh, uh, pump, and you buy it and go in to pay for it, and that's that. Virtually no difference. Virtually no difference, just a parallel process. The same process is used for delivery of natural gas to service stations as used for gasoline. It goes from a tank, put into a tank truck, taken to a tank at the service station, offloaded, and then from the tank at the service station, it is, goes to a pump that dispenses it to the customer exactly the same process. Well, Charles Judge has mentioned several times about the the uh, large trucks and the benefits for that. And, yes. And uh, we got Mac, Peterbilt, Navistar, of course, Kenworth, make the subsidiary of Mac, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, the, all these companies are, tell us a little bit about the Mac truck you said was. Well, what you have is that most of the manu major manufacturers of over-the-road trucks and for the class eight trucks are developing alternatives for uh, companies to order typically with uh, with what's referred to as a Westport engine uh, others uh, such as Mac are having their own engine series available for natural gas coming here in the fall they're they're also offering the intermediate size trucks, for example, a uh, solid waste truck that is set to use natural gas. There, um, and so what you think of is your normal box delivery truck, uh, ten wheelers are available with for the use of natural gas, and your over the road eighteen wheelers. The over the road market. Uh, as we develop a network of service stations, uh, if they're developed even out as far as 400 miles apart, this this will work for over-the-road trucks uh, to get the process started. And we're developing lanes across the United States. That Tell us have about a, the lanes they told us about at your forum well, about three and a half years ago, well, California have, to Texas. Well, you have a lane from California to Texas, a lane from Salt Lake. Uh, down to Los Angeles. By lane, you mean you mean a track from one station to another? Yeah, you you can you can operate and refuel with natural gas all the way. Uh, but I think the where it will start in this area is with with operating on fleets, and that's where it, where it has generally across the United States. And so you build a cluster, and then as you develop the uh, uh, truck stops with natural gas, then uh, you can simply uh, go from truck stop to truck stop and refuel on your natural gas. Well, so in the future, um, when the CNG station at Scott Fork is completed, it could be just one along a line of a, one, a member of a cluster. Yes, that's correct. Well, Judge Charles, hopefully well, people have a better understanding. Of, uh, well, we hope so. And on we're, we're on the leading edge of this, uh, the third fuel revolution, as Charles and I have discussed today. Pike County, Kentucky is on the leading edge, on the cutting edge of this new fuel revolution. And we ought to be. The, the amount of natural gas that we produce, a domestic fuel, 
here. We've talked about the security of this country. We've talked about the economic situation in America, what this will do for what it will do for the bottom line of county government, boards of education, uh, the Big Sandy Transportation, and all of them, and what it would do for our industry. And uh, this, uh, uh, I hope that people understand and want them to understand that Pike County government is never going to be in the service station business. We're in the economic development business. And uh, this is truly economic development of what it will do for our industry, what it will do for a plant like Kellogg's, we mentioned that name before, and what it will do for all of the producers of coal in, the, in central Appalachia. And uh, we, uh, we see these companies coming forward, like we've mentioned uh, uh, Dennis Rohr today and his, all the work he's put into it and the other local people that we see these days. And as Charles said, it will, will be throughout the central Appalachia. And Judge, this is hardly, and Charles, you can weigh in on this too, this is hardly um, even an idea. It's not going to be a competitor with gasoline, of course, right now at least. And no. it's not even, that's not even the idea behind it. Oh gosh, no. Uh, no, and it would be just a service center and have these four different fuels for be sold at the same service center. Be a service station, as you, Charles has said, it'd be the same process as you, you do it today, but it'd be, it'd be one half the price of diesel fuel, one half the price of gasoline. And it's, a, it's by fuel, uh, dual fuel. It goes from one of the other. Some of the vehicles turn over with computers. Some has a button on them, right. but it, they, they're all there. Uh, we we are on the cutting edge. Uh, our, uh, a lot of lot of thought, a lot of vision have gone into this, and uh, we uh, we certainly are we we're enthused by what we've found out with meetings uh, around the country and and uh, and especially in Frankfurt and knowing that the that the state of Kentucky is, is with 14 other states and the state of Kentucky is going to have and and the fact that. Uh, that they're going to retrofit uh, all of their, from Paducah to Pikeville, and the, of the state, they're going to start with transportation departments of using that natural gas, because that's where the most vehicles are located in state government. And it's, as, as Charles has emphasized, and you too at times, fleet. That's, that's the key word to this, isn't it, Charles? Mm -hmm. It's fleet. And that's how it will start, and then it will spread around this country. And uh, we are in this, we're, we're, this is a reality, this is not a pot dream, uh, it is, it is, uh, is happening, uh, we're, on the, we're on the forefront of it and uh, we, uh, we're going to see, it. we're going to work hard, Charles and I are, in the, in the next uh, few and months and next few years to see that this happens. And to, to speak to the question of it, you know, people are spending, major corporations don't make major investments in technology unless they think it's for real. So we have Peterbilt and Mac and Navistar and CAT and Chrysler and Ford and General Motors and, and I think that's a, a large part of the industrial heart of the United States right there uh, making a commitment. Gives it uh, a reality. Gives it something, to reality. something to stand on. Uh, well, uh, Judge Charles, thank you. On behalf of Judge Rutherford and Charles Carlton, uh, thanks for watching the Pike County Report. Thank you. Thank you.